Hi there and welcome to the first show of the year for me. This is my first Facebook Live. Sorry we're a couple of minutes late starting, you know, uh, technical glitches and stuff like that, which of course the great Danny O took care of. Um, so I wanted to just kick off by first showing my gratitude for all of you. Thank you so much, everybody who tunes in. I love that we've built up a little community. We've actually built up a community on Facebook as well as on YouTube and the people who comment below my, um, be below my videos, I've noticed that um, I'm, I'm really beginning to recognize you and recognizing your style and your questions and I love that. I love that I'm seeing the same people and you're starting to communicate with each other. I just love that we've built a community. Um, just so you know, I do have a couple of other online communities and if you look them up on Facebook, um, one is called Author Discussion Group, Anita Murjani Author Discussion Group, and another one is called From Healing to Whole. So one is specifically to discuss ideas and concepts that I speak about um, and the other one is for people who are going through challenging times, challenging illnesses and things. But just to manage your expectations, because I am currently like so so involved in doing these videos and also in writing my book and, and also traveling for events, I'm not actually participating in these groups, but there is a beautiful community of people, like-minded people that support each other. So I just wanted you to know that. So anyway, um, I just want to say that I'm also really grateful for so many things this year, so many opportunities and just uh, everything. The 2018 wasn't <clears throat> my favorite year for, for many reasons. Um, a couple of them being that we did face a few health challenges, many of them very challenging, but not life threatening, thankfully. Um, it gave us an opportunity to grow though. And I had probably one of the worst flus that I've ever had earlier in the year. I actually believe it was pneumonia. Um, and, but I was just treating it like a normal flu, but it was really bad. Danny went through a bout of sciatica and, you know, various things. We had other various hurdles like that, um, but we've come through it and we've come through it stronger. And this is also my way of telling you that just because I'm here um, speaking to you and telling you about challenges and how to deal with them and how I deal with them, it doesn't mean I don't face any challenges myself. We all do. As long as we're in human form, there will always be challenges for us to, um, to go through and, to, and hurdles to jump over. There'll always be things that will strengthen us. And, um, and so that's what I wanted you to know, but also that I am so grateful for where I am right now and I wouldn't change it for anything. And so grateful from all of you, to all of you for being here. And um, thank you for all your comments. I'm just reading them. Nina, lovely Anita, happy new year. Camilla Reed, thank you. Thank you all for all your beautiful comments. I will get to a couple of questions in a bit, but what I wanted to try today is um, we have picked out a couple of questions that come up time and again, like frequently asked questions, which I don't think I've addressed properly. And I'm going to get Danny to read them out um, from behind the scenes and I will answer them for, for your benefit. And then I'll get to one or two of your questions, which you've been posting here. Okay, Boo, I'm ready for your first question. <laughs> and yes, I do call him Boo. And to all of our fans out there, if you're in France, uh, bonjour. If you're in uh, Germany, uh, guten tag from uh, Japan. Uh, oh, gozaimasu, or would that be konnichiwa? Um, Yay! That's the uh, complete uh, limit of my... Uh, Jo-san. Uh, Jo-san, exactly. Yes, yes, I've forgotten about uh, Jo-san. <laughs> right, one of the questions that we get regularly that people uh, ask is... Um, Anita, the more your story spreads, you attract skeptics and debunkers. How do you deal with that? Great question. Okay, so the thing is, 
that um, it's, it's just a normal thing and it's something that anybody out there, if any of you are wanting to share your story uh, of something that's happened to you, maybe a healing experience or a, uh, I think this, this is a good question for me to answer for the benefit of many of you who write to me and say that you've had a phenomenal experience and you want to share it. So the more your story spreads, on the one hand, you're probably thinking, oh my God, I want to get really famous. I want my story to spread. I want everyone to know it. Here's the thing. The more your story spreads, you attract, of course, people who are fans, who love you, but you also attract debunkers. Um, so if you have no debunkers, no skeptics, it means that you are preaching to the choir. It means that your audience hasn't broken out into mainstream. As soon as you go into mainstream, that's it. You are going to get critics. So um, basically, let's call them critics. I don't like to call them skeptics because healthy skepticism is good. A little bit of skepticism is always really good because it helps you to um, to make the right choices. It helps you to be discerning. It helps you to not get cheated or duped. Um, and basically, it prevents you from falling for the charlatans, the snake oil salesmen. So it's good to be skeptical. But when you have something genuine uh, to, to share, um, you the, the bigger, the more mainstream you go, the more you will not only attract people who are fans, who believe you, who love you, who want to hear more of you, you will also attract critics. So um, how do I deal with the critics or the, the debunkers or, the, or whatever we want to call them? Uh, first of all, my default is actually not to engage with them. And the reason I don't engage with them is because in order to engage with them and convince them, many of them have already made up their mind. I don't think it's my job to convince them. But in order to create an argument with which to convince them, I have to sort of speak in their, in their language at their level. So when you have a critic to, or, or someone who's trying to debunk you, it means they are on a completely different frequency. It means I then have to go and communicate with them on the frequency they're on. And what I mean by this is that in this case, in the case of the subjects that I talk about, um, I like to speak more about us being six sensory beings, about us being just the tip of the iceberg. What we don't see about who we are is so much greater. Illness starts on the energetic level. I like to really speak to people who get that, who know that, who believe that, who understand that. And then we work our way through that. In other words, that's the direction I feel the most joyful in is when I'm talking about that. But the minute you're speaking to a debunker, that debunker is coming from the viewpoint that we are physical three-dimensional beings and there is nothing beyond that. There is nothing more after we die. <clears throat> so I then have to squish myself into that mindset to then try to convince them there is more. And when I squish myself into that mindset and speak uh, to people who only believe that we are three-dimensional beings and there's nothing more and who are convinced of it and who are adamant to convince me that I am either fooling people or I am delusional, um, that just engaging in that space for a long period of time actually drains me. So I don't like doing that. But secondly, when I do engage at that level, I attract more skeptics and debunkers who then join the fray and so you get caught in this downward spiral. So um, I, I want to say this for people who are on the verge of sharing their own story, on the verge of uh, publishing a book with something that could be, uh, you know, could attract critics. This is what I want to tell you is that uh, speak to the people who believe you. If you engage with the critics, it gets you caught up with them and it also attracts more critics because you're designing your language around critics. The minute I start designing my language for critics, it actually attracts more critics. 
However, for the sake of this video, so my general rule is I don't engage with critics, um, but for the sake of this video and for the sake of some people who might be healthily skeptical, let me go deeper into this subject. Um, if I was to tell somebody who's healthily skeptical that, hey, what happened to me was real, what would I tell you? So I would say that first of all, if I was lying, if I was faking it, if I was lying, um, there would have to be a whole lot of other people lying to protect me or to, to keep up with this facade. That would be my family members um, who were all there when it happened, um, my general practitioner doctor, um, you know, and basically Dr. Ko who came and um, who, who came and gave me an endorsement and who told me I need to go out and share this with the world. Um, there would be also Dr. Oz, his team scrutinized my um, medical records. So if you have uh, somebody in your family who's skeptical and you want to convince them of my story, tell them that please watch the Dr. Oz segment because they were very careful about having me on and they said we really, when they invited me, they said we really need to scrutinize your medical records. So I sent my medical records to them. Um, and only when they were satisfied and we kept sending them more and more stuff and when they were completely satisfied they had me on the show and they even flashed my medical records on the screen so um, there would have to be a lot of people to help me with the cover-up all my friends my in-laws everybody who knew me in hong kong there would have to be a hell of a lot of people so that's number one which would be crazy if if i was actually making this up number two is i do have photos so i have seen comments from people who say hey i haven't seen her medical records okay there's a reason i don't put my medical records uh, to free float on the internet because again there are people who are debunkers critics, whatever, uh, they would tamper with it. I don't want to do that. However, whenever I am giving a speech, I do flash them up on the screen. But uh, lately I've stopped doing that because I mostly attract people who already know this is true and it's happened to me. But um, I did give them to Dr. Oz and they flashed it up on the, on the screen. So if you want to see my medical records, watch that Dr. Oz segment. For those people who say, oh, there are no photos. So a couple of things, if you go into my website, if you look at my story, or if, even if you download my press kit, you will see photos there of me really, really sick. I did not take photos of me at my worst when I was lying in the hospital bed on the oxygen tank um, because I didn't know I was going to live. I thought I was dying. I didn't want anyone to see me in that condition. But I do have photos of me looking like a skeleton. A um, couple of other things that I want to say, uh, which I've seen maybe debunkers uh, say to me. And again, I want to say this, I'm, I don't want to engage in a conversation with debunkers, but I'm saying this in case you have skeptical family members and you're just um, trying to tell them, yeah, it does happen. Um, the other thing I want to say is that my doctor, my oncologist who treated me, he knew something had happened. Um, he was one of the top oncologists in Hong Kong, and he said he didn't even know what to write in my medical records. When I told him what took place, he completely believed me, like completely believed me. And he said, you're not the first person that I've heard this kind of story from. And he agreed that he could not attribute it to the drugs and the medicine. However, um, what he didn't realize what, was that the story would actually become something, my story would become something that the press would be interested in and other people would be interested in. He didn't know that I would actually talk about it. When I started talking about it, a newspaper wanted to interview me. And when the newspaper interviewed me, they said, would your oncologist be willing to, um, would your oncologist be willing to verify what you said? And I said, of course, that, of course he would. He completely believed me. However, when they interviewed him, he did not say to the press what he had said to me. He said completely, something completely different. He said it was the chemotherapy. He knew it wasn't, but he said it was. Um, he said it was because he had 
taken out the fluid from my lungs. Now, the thing is I had had fluid removed from my lungs for the past six months and it never really did anything except to come back. It was that time that he removed it when I was in the near death experience where I was having this shift take place internally. Um, it was from that point on that the disease never came back. So that's what I wanted to say. And he was aware of it. Um, but at the same time, I understand why he did what he did because it's not his fault. He was actually, he is actually a very kind and gentle man. I don't want to throw him under the bus. When another oncologist stepped in, Dr. Peter Koh, who um, also studied my case, he went in to look at, read the hospital records and he said, whichever way I look at it, you should be dead. He knew it wasn't the chemo that did it. I asked him why my oncologist reacted that way. And this oncologist said, I don't blame him. He's at the top of his game in the industry. The minute he says anything different, and this is going back 13 years ago, it was February of 2006. So this Dr. Ko said, the minute somebody says it's anything else, an oncologist at the top of his game says it's somebody, something else, like even something like, oh my God, a, a transcendent experience that caused the shift. He's going to be seen as a quack. He's not going to risk that. He's really not going to risk that. So I completely understood where he was coming from. So I asked this oncologist who was studying my case, why are you willing to endorse me? Why are you giving me a testimony and telling me to go and share it with the world? He said, because I'm retired. I have nothing to lose. Um, and he said, I, he said, I have a fear of cancer, but I'm not interested in studying cancer. Um, I'm not interested in studying the research for the disease. I'm interested in studying people who have had spontaneous healings. And so he was very interested in my case. Having said that, even my general practitioner endorsed that it happened. He went on the radio to say that because of what my oncologist had done. Um, and sure enough, uh, Dr. Ko, the oncologist who stepped in for me, and my general practitioner, my family doctor, they were of course subsequently by some people labeled as quacks. And, by, and so, you know, it's like if people choose not to believe, that's their prerogative. They have made that decision. I don't think it's my um, job to convince them otherwise. Um, and so, but here's the other piece. One of the reasons why I even wanted to go into this topic today and even say what I've said is because I feel for the people who are on the fence, who want to believe me, and if they get convinced by the debunkers, then the problem is they are losing out on the chance of knowing that their body is capable of so much more than what we have been led to believe. This is what drives me to share my story. What drives me is that I actually want you to know that your body is phenomenal, that your body is really smart. I really want you to know that. I want you to know that you don't need to depend on drugs and all these things. I want you to empower yourself. I'm not asking you to believe in me. I'm asking you to believe in you. I want you to learn the capacity of who you are. That's what I'm inviting you to do. Um, Sometimes debunkers will say they don't trust me because I've written a book and I'm doing it to sell books. The crazy thing about that is that when I shared my story, when I put it out on the internet, I didn't have a book. I was doing it because I just wanted you to know this. And so if people feel I'm being manipulative because I don't have a, a, because I have a book, the thing is it was Wayne Dyer who discovered my story. And if he didn't encourage me to write a book and put me up on the, on the stage, you wouldn't even have heard of me. You wouldn't even hear me saying this. You wouldn't even have heard of me to debunk me. So that argument doesn't even make sense. Um, and the other thing, it, you know, um, I actually believe that if you want to mistrust somebody, um, 
I can't help this, but I have a much greater mistrust of the pharmaceutical industry than of someone who's written a book to share what's happened to them. That's just me. I feel a lot of the things that people feel are manipulative and so on, um, I actually see the big pharma companies doing that and the medical industry doing that. That's not to say doctors are bad. Many doctors are really there to help us. Many doctors are there, you know, my own oncologist who may have attributed to chemo when he was interviewed, when he was under the gun, when he was treating me, he was lovely. He was very gentle. And um, many doctors who go into this field do it to help people. It's the industry. The industry is funded by the pharmaceutical companies and so on. So anyway, um, that's, that's basically my take on the, on the debunkers and the reason why I share what I share. Uh, truly. I share it because I truly want you to know what your body is capable of. And also speaking of books, in my book Dying to Be Me, I do explain a lot of what I just said, especially towards the back of the book. I do explain a lot of this and I do address skeptics. My publishers even encouraged me to do that because they, they felt that I had a genuine story to share. And so uh, just for the people on this fence, the people who are healthily skeptical, they told me to include something that would help them. So thanks. Um, so what I'd like to do is I think Danny has a couple more questions for me. So I'd like to go into a couple more questions, unless we have some fabulous questions from the audience before we go into a couple of questions. And thank you for all your wonderful comments. And um, previously in a video, I was drinking out of this teacup and someone com uh, commented on how tiny it is. Yes, it is. The reason it's so tiny is because I use a little thermos flask to keep my tea warm. I don't know if you know, but it is so cold right now. Uh, we've got the heating on. I moved here for the warm weather, Southern California, but it is pretty cold today. So um, go ahead, Boo. <laughs> oh, one more thing. I just wanted to say uh, another thing I'm gra uh, grateful for is the fact that Danny has decided to come on the show more often, and I know he'll come on again. And a lot of people have commented how much you love him. Thank you. And you've said how much you love the conversation between us and how you laugh when he's on the show. I love that. Thank you. Okay. We're ready for you, Boop. Okay. Um, so one of the other questions, and you sort of alluded to this already when you were answering the, uh, the first question, um, but the, the other question that a lot of people ask is, so... Anita, what are your beliefs about cancer? That's a great question. So I don't believe that um, cancer is what people think it is. I actually believe that um, it's we need to treat cancer differently. And I'm just going to, because I scribbled some notes about it before I came on the show. And so I would like to just refer to my notes bef uh, so that I can get in, so that I can tell you. So basically, my beliefs about cancer is that I think that the fear of cancer is a far greater disease than cancer itself. The monster that we have created out of cancer is far greater than the cancer itself. And I actually think that because the medical industry, um, because they don't understand it themselves, they're researching, but in a way I actually believe they're looking in a lot of the wrong places. Their research is purely focused on the physical. It's purely focused on diagnostic tools and drugs, that's it. These are the two things that research is focused on. And so because they don't have a handle on it and because cancer is not going to fit into that box of diagnostic tools and, and drugs, it just it doesn't fit into that box. So that's why it's turned out to be something that the medical industry does not have a handle on. And because of that, they fear it. And they have in turn spread that fear onto us. And so the fear of cancer has become bigger than the cancer itself. And um, 
And because they don't understand it, they have pulled out these, their big guns, which is the chemo and the radiation. And while the, that is all that they have, these two things, the, the, the chemo and the radiation, also leaves a lot of collateral damage in our bodies. And because of the collateral damage, they tell us, we in fact get weakened while they're trying to kill the cancer, we become weakened. And this is why the medical industry tells us you're in remission because they kind of have this feeling that, oh, it might come back because they haven't got a handle on it. So what we are absorbing is this whole fear of the medical industry not having a handle on what this is. My views is something completely different. And in order to get to the crux of what my view is, um, I want to share with you a little story. So first of all, I actually do feel that people who are super sensitive and empathic are somewhat more prone to getting illnesses in general because they absorb the energies around them. I don't want this to panic you if you're an empath or super sensitive. I want you actually to be aware of it so that you can take more care of yourself and recharge your batteries more. So, um, and, and this is, and people ask me all the time, this leads to another question. Why do our pets get cancer? Why do children get cancer? If you think it's to do with our emotional and mental state, why do young people, young children get cancer? So this is a very delicate subject because um, I really wanna be careful how I frame this. Children are very sensitive. And if a child isn't particularly empathic, then they are more prone to absorbing the energies around them. Now, when I say that your children your child may have got sick because they've absorbed the energies around them. And, and if I say, how, um, how are things with you as the parent? Are you going through stressful times? Immediately the parent feels guilty or at fault that they've done this to their child. I would want you to know that it's not your fault. You are just dealing with life yourself. You really are. However, I would want you to know that if you have a sick child, it is extremely important for you to take care of yourself and uplift yourself. So instead of immediately putting that child into treatment and chemotherapy or whatever, have a look at the energies, at the, your child's surroundings. Are they being bullied at school? Um, have you been stressed? And, have, and try and uplift yourself. All of this is equally, if not more important in helping to heal your child. Having said that, there are of course some children and young people that are born with disease and that is just part of who they are. It's part of who they came here to be. And it's part of what they came here to learn from and to teach other people around them. It just is what it is. And so we just have to deal with it the best that we can. I am a big fan of someone who passed away recently, um, Claire Wineland, and many of you know who she is. She was born with um, cystic fibrosis, so which is like a mu which is um, mucus or fluid in the lungs, and so she always had to breathe with the aid of an oxygen tank. And her family were prepared that her condition would deteriorate and she wouldn't live very long. And I love that um, she made the best of her her life. And I do believe that that was who she came here to be. Sadly, she passed away recently. But she knew from the time she was young that her life wasn't going to be very long. However, she made a decision at some point that she was going to go for a lung transplant. And interestingly, it wasn't the lung transplant itself that um, took her life. It was after the transplant she suffered from a blood clot. I think it was a brain aneurysm. Um, but anyway, having said that, I actually believe that it was her life's purpose to live as long as she did and to bring the teachings that she did. She is such a powerful soul that people continue to share her inspiring videos and her inspiring life story. So people have a purpose. Their life, whatever length of time they live, is a purpose. So even if someone passes away, they have not lost the battle. That's what I want you to know. Our lives, our bodies are not battles, battlegrounds. They are not 
Um, cancer in our body is not to be fought like a battle. It is a sign that we have to take care of ourselves more. It is a sign that we are more than our physical bodies. So if you check out some of my past videos, I speak about how we are much more than our bodies. We are like just the tip of the iceberg. And the bigger part of us is beyond this physical body. Illness starts at, um, at the energetic level. So now I'm talking about illnesses that you get because some of us do get ill from the life that we lead by taking on too much, by, from saying yes when we mean no, from things like that. So not part of our soul contract, of being born with an illness, but more the other way, we get ill because we get drained. So I would actually encourage people to look at all those things. One quick story. When I had cancer and my health was deteriorating, I was in an environment where people were really, really fearful of cancer. The doctors were instilling fear in me. Um, and, my, and I watched the cancer con continue to deteriorate. I had a very close friend, my best friend, who was also going through cancer, who was dealing, who was having treatments from the best hospitals that money can possibly pay for, and yet her condition was deteriorating. And as I was watching all this, my condition continued to deteriorate. I then one day decided I was going to remove myself from my environment and I took myself to a completely different environment for six months for the purpose of healing the cancer. I went into an environment where the word cancer was hardly ever used. I was told that my body was just going through um, a, a mis, uh, like an imbalance. It was an imbalance and then I was, so I went to India. Um, I worked under a yogi master and the yogi master never used the word cancer but helped me to balance my body, helped me also to eat foods that um, were good for me, that what my body needed and helped me to learn more about what my body needed and things like that. And six months I was in that environment where the word cancer wasn't used, where I was able to read books that I wanted to read, that I loved to read. I was able to do things that were inspiring and uplifting. And I actually saw myself heal. And even the yogi masters said, oh my gosh, you are looking so much better. And even the lumps and the tumors that I could feel beneath my skin were getting softer and they were dissolving and they were disappearing. They weren't gone 100%, but they were pretty much like probably 70, 80% less than what they were when I had arrived there. So that was in six months. So I decided I was ready to go back home, back home to my old environment, um, because I figured I could continue doing what I was doing from home. I went back home and I was again enveloped in this fear-based environment where people were saying, you need to go to the doctor. You need to get scans. How can you trust those quacks? How can you trust people like that? Don't do that. If there's even one cancer cell in your body, you're in danger. And that's when the fear came back. That fear had gone for six months. The fear came back and I started to feel the tumors come back. I started to feel my lymph nodes growing and hardening again. I was living in this space of, oh my God, doctors, hospitals, scans, <gasps> they're going to find the cancer because it's not 100% gone. If only I could keep doing what I was already doing. And it came back. And then eventually I did go to the hospital and I continued to fear. Uh, the thing about me is I actually fear and have always feared hospitals. And then the rest is history. You've read it in the book, Dying to Be Me, or have seen my, read it on my website, or my, seen my YouTube videos where I speak about how I ended up being stage four. But there was a six month period in there where I removed myself from that fearful environment. So I thought it was important to share that with you, um, which I think leads us to 
our third question. Wait, there's a question from, um, from one of you out there. What are your thoughts on the adverts that we see on TV? This is from Tracy Coulson. Let's push it, push it up on screen so you can all read it. It's a great question. What are your thoughts on the adverts that we see on TV all the time, spreading the fear of cancer, showing people with cancer, guilting us into spending money on cancer research and programming us with cancer kills fear? I dislike them thoroughly. I think that they perpetuate cancer. I truly think that if we spent all our dollars, our trillions of dollars that we spend on cancer awareness, cancer advertisements, cancer research, if we spent all those trillions of dollars, all those adverts focused all that energy on health awareness instead, what does it mean to be healthy, to, be, to feel well, to be joyful? If the focus was on that, we would see a different reality. Because if you notice that even though our focus is on cancer research, cancer awareness, cancer this, cancer that, do you see it getting better? No. Do you see the numbers going down? No. I really think it's about the focus. I truly feel that. Right now, the focus is on fear of cancer. We need to shift that focus to love of life, love of well-being, joy of life. We need to shift that focus, which is why when I speak to people who are dealing with illness, I try not to use the word cancer, but it's hard because how do you address someone who has already labeled what they have as cancer and you want them to see it differently. You need to refer to it. So for me, what I do is I actually work on helping people to focus on living. That is the biggest determining, um, determining factor of your health is your focus on living life. It's not your focus on eradicating disease. That's the wrong focus. Eradicating disease is the wrong focus. Living life healthily is where we need to be focused. So um, let's go on to the, to the third question. And the third question is, and I see that there is a question pumped up, but I will go, go to that question at the end. So I would like Boo to ask me the third question. And Okay, so the third question again, all follows along the same uh, sort, of, uh, sort of line. Uh, and this querent says, Anita, so if it were up to you, how would people with cancer be treated? That's a great question. And it ties in with the question I see on the screen from Otgon, Otgon Ginge. Um, I'm sorry if I pro pronounce your name wrong. And she asks how to treat cancer on energetic stage. Thank you. Okay, that is exactly what I want to answer now. So if it were up to me, um, so the people with cancer, the way they would be treated is, so first of all, I wouldn't have, um, I wouldn't have hospitals for illnesses. I would separate hospitals from what I would maybe call healing sanctuaries. It doesn't mean we eliminate hospitals altogether. I want to recognize that science has helped us. Medicine has helped us. I don't want to completely trash medicine. They are really great up to a point. They have helped us with things like um, antiseptics and whatever improvements that, that they've made. And they are great for emergencies. Medical emergencies, definitely a hospital, fantastic. However, illnesses are something completely different, but we've lumped it into one and we need to see them now as two separate things. For illnesses, I would create something that I, if it were up to me, if I had a hospital, it wouldn't be called a hospital, it would be called a healing sanctuary. And here's what would take place if it were my healing sanctuary. And by the way, this is what I actually try and do in my retreats. Unfortunately, these retreats aren't covered by insurance, which is another form of manipulation that I have an issue with, is that your insurance company only supports the big pharmas. 
The insurance company doesn't support what you feel that your physical body needs. And that's a whole other issue. But anyway, um, we seem to have accepted all that in our paradigm though, which is weird. But my healing sanctuary, if you came in with something that which we today call cancer, but at some time in the future, we will no longer use that word, but you came in with something that concerned you, the first thing is that we would have a bunch of people speak to you, but these people would not be wearing white coats, they would not be analyzing you, they would not be condescending towards you, they would not act like they know your body more than you do. Um, they would be people who would be really friendly and their purpose is to take you from where you are now to optimum health. Their purpose is not to scrutinize you and look for disease, which is what the current system does. They're focused on looking for disease. No, the purpose of the people who are in my healing sanctuary would be to take you from where you are now to optimum health. So the first thing they would do is that they would ask you some questions. They would ask you, have you suffered a trauma recently? Are you lonely? Do you feel your life has meaning or purpose? Do you have any major fears? Like, are you, is your life run by fear instead of love and passion? Are you fearing your financial condition? Are you fearing your health? Are you feel, fearing you've got something serious going on with you? Um, are you the kind of person who is a giver, like a rescuer, who's always there for everyone else and you're not there for yourself? Are you someone who has trouble receiving? Do you feel drained all the time? Are you a people pleaser? Do you give of yourself too much? Um, do you have trouble saying no? Do you have joy in your life? Um, are you somebody that, um, do you have people in your life who you love? or who love you? Are you eating foods, clean foods, that nourish you, that make you feel good and nourished? You know, these are the kinds of questions I'd, I'd, I'd ask. And I can think of many, many more I could go on. But here's the point. So when the, my team would ask you these questions, they would be getting you to talk and you would start to understand things about your life. Using these questions, they would then work with you to work through your issues. They would be like coaches, like life coaches, counselors. They would work with you through your fears, through your issues, through not, not having a purpose, through recent traumas you may have gone through, because all those things are what's contributing to that illness that you today go, go to a hospital or to a doctor for. All those things at an energetic level are contributing factors. My hospital or healing sanctuary would help you work through those, but also it would help you to work out, tune in to your, it would, they would help you to tune into your body to figure out what foods are nourishing for you. What supplements do your body, does your body need to support it? Also, I would love to, you know, if I had the resources, the kinds of diagnostic tools I would develop would be more like diagnostic tools that would help you to measure the life force energy that is going through your body. That Because each one of us has life force energy going through us. And the more life force energy you have going through you, the healthier you are. But what makes your life force energy more vibrant and what makes it less? Things like trauma, things like fear. Fear makes it less. Trauma makes it less. Loneliness, lack of purpose. So my diagnostic tools would measure things like that and, and would measure what are the things that get your life force energy up? Is it when you eat certain foods? Is it when you feel joyful? Is it when you spend time with certain people? And the idea would be to help you keep your life force energy higher for longer periods of time because the higher your life force energy is for prolonged periods of time, the more likely your body will heal on its own without drugs. And that would be my purpose is to train your body to heal itself. However, if you have reached the end of your life, 
or you have reached the point where it's time for you to cross over, you would cross over with dignity. You would not be made to feel that, um, that, uh, that you have lost the battle. So that's kind of what my healing sanctuary would look like. Uh, and people say, but you know, there aren't the funds to support ideas like that. Well, here's the thing. Currently, we do have, um, we seem to be spending trillions of dollars on diagnostic tools that actually are so archaic that they, that they flatten our boobs like a pancake. God knows who invented archaic diagnostic tools like that. But we seem to invent tools like that, which I hope one day get relegated to a museum, when instead I truly believe that we can have much gentler diagnostic tools. Because what I'd love to hear from is, I'd love to hear from you if you are somebody who is an empath and who truly fears hospitals. If are you somebody who truly fears all the tests and things that hospitals give you? Because here's the thing, all these fears actually lower your life force energy. And we need this life force energy for our own healing. So shouldn't hospitals actually be increasing our energy and not decreasing it? Because the life force energy is actually what strengthens our immune system, which is exactly what we need when we're unwell. Um, so I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear from you more about these topics that I've, I've talked about. And even when I, if I don't get to your questions at a particular Facebook live, I do read them because you inspire me. You inspire me to give you more information and to go deeper into what I do. And I see there's a great question from Corinne Roquet. In your healing sanctuaries, would you help people to understand the emotional reason about their illness? Help them to see something they don't see in their own life, or is it useless? Absolutely, that is a huge purpose for the Healing Sanctuary. In fact, that's kind of what I do in my retreats already at the moment. Um, at the moment, what we do do is really take them deep into answering those kinds of questions, into journaling, and that's what I do anyway. But what I would love is to one day see actual sanctuaries, not just retreats that you go to for five days, seven days, but actually like hospitals that are there all the time for people to go to that are actually funded by insurance so that anybody can go. I don't like it that people who can't afford it um, have to, are forced to be manipulated by the, um, by the pharmaceutical paradigm. That doesn't sit right with me. Um, I actually know somebody whose family wrote to me and said their, um, their family member basically was told by the doctors that there, there was nothing more that she could do for her illness. And basically they had done everything. And so there was nothing more that the doctors could do and she had to live with this illness. However, uh, and, and what they meant was not just live with the illness, but she had to, basically that, that was the end of the road for her, that she was gonna die soon. Anyway, she found a product that was not pharmaceutical. It was a natural plant-based product that was actually helping her. It was actually reducing the size of her tumors, this plant-based product, but she was having trouble affording it and affording being able to go out of the country to obtain it because it was illegal in this country. So to be able to actually do that and to go somewhere and to be able to stay there long enough to administer the product, her insurance company, of course, would not pay for that. And so she ended up dying because she could not afford the product that worked for her, but the insurance company would only pay for a product that was not working for her. So this is the irony of the paradigm that we live in. And so this is why when people, um, if somebody were to say to me that, hey, what you're sharing is, is dangerous because you're giving people false hope. Um, what I actually say is that how is giving people hope dangerous. In fact, one of the reasons I share what I share is because I want people to have hope. I don't want the medical paradigm to take that hope away from you. When they tell you that you have only three months to live or that there's nothing you can do, 
I don't want you to believe that. I want you to know always until your last breath, as long as you are breathing, there is always hope because the worst thing you can do for someone is to take away their hope. That's far more dangerous. So I want to leave you with those words and I want to say thank you all of you for tuning in, for all your love, for all your comments. Um, if you were in front of me, I give you a big group hug. And so I really love you guys. I hope to see you in person eventually. I love meeting you and stay tuned. Next week, I'll have more. Bye.